real quick. Okay. okay. So, Go ahead. Uh, I'm going to call the uh, committee meeting of the Town Services and Outreach Committee meeting of May 30, 2024, to order. Um, it is uh, two minutes after 10. And we'll start, as always, uh, this meeting is being held remotely um, according to current um, state law provisions regarding uh, meetings that allow us to do committee meetings remotely. Um, and uh, we make every effort to make sure that the public has access through the Zoom link and uh, uh, I want to just remind everybody that the meeting is being recorded so that they're aware of that. And I'm going to now go to see, make sure that all of the committee members can hear and be heard. So, uh, Bob Hagner. Present. Uh, George Ryan. Present. Jennifer Tau. Present. Uh, Council Lord. Can you unmute and let us know that you can hear? Yeah. Councilor Lord, Andy just called on you. Yep. Okay. Oh, we can't hear you. Do you want to check on the... So you might need to just check your audio settings next to the mute button or as part of the mute button. Oh, she's... She looks like she's going to come back on. Okay, uh, so uh, let's take a look at the uh, audience. If there is anyone who's in the audience from Port River School, please raise their hand. Uh, and we'll make sure that check to see. Do you want to check, Athena, to see if uh one hand up is from Ford River. I'm gonna bring in the fifth graders. Becca Watkins, are you here from the fourth grade class or fifth grade? I'm sorry, fifth grade class. Sorry, no. Okay, we'll come back to public comment. Thank you. Um again, if uh, there's somebody here from the fifth grade class. I I just brought them in. You just brought them in. Oh great. So let me explain the uh, agenda for um, everybody present and uh, members of the public who are present. Um, what uh, we're going to be doing today is shuffling the agenda that was posted. Uh, we are using the agenda today, but uh, the order is slightly different. Uh, we're going to start with the um, presentation. Fifth graders have asked to um, make a presentation to the committee and they can uh, tell us um, about what the presentation is. Uh, but we want to start with that and then uh, go to public comment uh, for other members of the public. Uh, we, after that, uh, Paul Bachelman is joining us. He is uh, out of town, but he is joining us so that uh, he has some appointments that he needs to present to the committee and then we're going to come back for the all of the remaining agenda items about traffic safety um, and uh, speed limits heatherstone road um, mark and uh, uh, henry street after that so uh, all of the agenda items are planned but i first want to um take uh, that make a big welcome to fifth grade class from the Fort River School. And uh, it, you had asked for five minutes because you wanted to make a presentation to us about the um, topic of speed, uh, safe routes to schools, I think is generally. But if I misstated that, you'll correct me. So let me uh, welcome you and uh, please go ahead. Uh, hello. Good morning. Can you hear us okay? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay. Here, Councillor Steinberg and Amherst Town Services and Outreach Committee. 
We are Ms. Ball and Ms. Fisher's fifth grade class at Fort River Elementary School. We are here because we want to reduce the use of fossil fuels in order to protect the planet and our futures. One major way that kids can reduce fossil fuels is by biking and walking whenever we can. At the moment, we do not have any safe biking lanes or paths to get to and from school safely. We talked with Superintendent Mooring from Amherst DBW and learned that there was a bike lane planned on Belchertown Road from Cumberland Farms east down Route 9. That bike lane is going to be built on the street without any separation from traffic other than paint. As the bicycle slash bike community often says, and we agree, paint doesn't protect. We don't feel safe and parents and families don't either. We want the town of Amherst to prioritize safe biking experiences for the citizens of Amherst. We know that the town has put effort into this in the past, as we've looked at the bicycle and pedestrian network plan that town drafted on June 28th, 2019. We are calling upon the town to revisit and revise this plan and make it a priority. In particular, we want to see a separate bike lane or side path built on Belchertown Road from Echo Hill, if not further east, to the site of the new school in Fort River. This would allow students to bike to school instead of taking the bus or driving. In addition, many Amherst residents would be able to use the path to get to work or downtown because it is a high level dress road. We don't believe that many people would use a regular bike lane as the survey we created shows. Many more people would feel safe using a separated bike lane. If you are going to build a bike lane, build a safe one that people will actually use. On Pelham Road, there are many different obstacles on the sidewalk that make biking on it difficult. There are roads that interfere with the sidewalk. The sidewalk is often level with the road and some sections are quite broken up or only gravel. On top of that, there are also mailboxes on the sidewalks that can be hazardous to bikers and can force them to bike on the street. On trash collection days, people leave their trash bins on the sidewalk, which also proves to be hazardous. We have also learned that the town is considering two proposals that, that lower the speed limit and create greater safety for the community, including bikers and pedestrians. We support the idea of changing the times the lights flash on the school zone signs. We think they should flash from 7.30 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. and not just during drop off and pick up. This would cover the time after school programs like Posse God run as well as the times kids are at school. We also want to see the town adopt safety zones around playgrounds, schools, and elder care facilities. These safety zones would increase the safety of the elderly and children by lowering the speed limit to 20 miles per hour. We thank you for listening to us today and we urge and we urge the town to take action and be the wheels on our bike of progress. Sincerely, Walker, Jonah, Natalia, Logan, Bobby, Marin, Grady, Aim, Quinn, Eden, Jahal, Hey. Aya, Casey, Rocco, and Alex. So, I want to thank you for being here. And uh, a couple of things. One is uh, if there are any members of the committee who would like to uh, say anything or ask any questions, they should raise their hand and then I'll uh, recognize them because committee. this is a committee meeting and I. Uh, made uh, sure that you were part of the uh, presentation of the committee. And the other is, as I said to Ms. Paul, uh, Ms. Paul, that if you have a um, copy that you would like to present to us in writing, that um, it can be emailed to us and it will be uh, made available to the public through the pamphlet, uh, through the packet. And I see Councillor Ryan uh, wanted to say something, so please go ahead. Thank you, Andy. Um, thank you to all of these fine fifth graders for taking the time and working this up and presenting it to us. Um, we appreciate it very much. Um, it's a wonderful expression of your engagement in the town, and I think it's very impressive. 
And just as a basic lesson in politics, um, what you're doing is lobbying and you need to keep it up. So uh, over the next few months and even beyond, make sure that your elected representatives, namely the five of us here and the 13 of us on the council, continue to pursue this uh, topic and, and make something happen because what you want to have happen is a good thing and an important thing for the town. So um, be patient, but uh, keep keep our feet to the fire, as we sometimes say. And thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Councillor Ryan. Um, uh, Jennifer Taub, Councillor Taub. Yes, thank you. I, I also I want to thank um, the fifth grade class. I want to thank each of you very much for taking the time and the, the real thought that you've put into these recommendations. Um, I'm a avid biker, and I um, appreciate your advocacy, as uh, Councillor Ryan said, for the whole town. Um, I was recently biking down Belchertown Road, and you're right, I had to go on the sidewalk because there's no bike lanes and you lose it at certain points along the way. And that the, the paint really doesn't protect you, as you said, from the cars coming by. So um, we share your concerns and uh, uh, particularly appreciate I wasn't on the council in June of 2019, but I will go back and read that report. And, um, you know, it things, the wheels of government tend to work slowly, but we will, um, you know, we appreciate we will prioritize the um, issues and the uh, actions that you asked us to prioritize. So thank you for taking the time to write up such a great report and to meet with us today. So, and again, thank you. And uh, you were, the, our uh, town manager's present, our police chief is present, um, our uh, superintendent of public works and town engineer are um, all present. So there were um, a good group of count members of the council, members of the public through watching. Thank you very much. You had a great, you spoke to the right people and we will be talking about the very issues that you raised um, later in this meeting around 1030. So thank you so, so much for being with us. Thank you for, for your support. Okay. So um, with that, um, I think that the what we want to do is uh, go to public comment. And then after public comment, um, I'm going to um, ask the town manager about uh, the appointments that he wants to present us today. Andy? Um uh, Councilor Lord has rejoined us. Maybe we should check and see whether she can hear us. Thank you. Good point. You Thank you for pointing that out. Uh, Council Lord, can you hear yes, us? Yes, I can. I can hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Yay! Finally. Thank you. And I hope you were able to hear the fifth grade presentation. They were amazing. Yeah. Uh, so I um, um, next topic on the agenda is public comment um, and uh, we ask mem members of the public are of course entitled and encouraged to speak on any issues that are relevant to the committee um, and uh, we ask that you just identify yourself where you live not by you don't have to give an exact address but to give an, a, at least us an idea of generally uh where you live that you're resident and where and then um uh, try and we'd appreciate it if you try and limit it to two to three minutes uh, uh jeremy anderson great thank you so much That's, that was a tough act to follow uh jeremy anderson from high point drive i prepared a statement so i apologize for reading it but uh dear members of the tso the town staff and, and apd chief ting Many thanks for your time today and your thoughtful considerations of efforts to establish traffic calming measures across our beautiful town. And in particular, your efforts to establish a safety zone on Henry Street, adjacent to Cushman Scott Children's Center. Communities across the country are facing the same traffic problems as Amherst, namely that the number of pe fatal pedestrian accidents, the incidence of road rage, and the general feeling of unsafe road conditions for walkers, bikers, rollers, and drivers are increasing year after year. That's why I'm so grateful that we are all here today to discuss positive changes that we can make to how we think about engaging as a community to improve our infrastructure, educate, 
and provide fair and equitable traffic enforcement. I'm so thrilled that we're joined by the Fort River Elementary School students today and that the town council will be hosting them at City Hall next week to discuss how to make the routes to our schools safer. Unfortunately, as the students explained, the reality is that we do not have safe routes in Amherst to any of our schools, to our businesses, or even to our recreational opportunities, but we can. Last month, I started serving as a fellow for the National Walking College, along with Transportation Advisory Committee member, Christine Lindstrom. As fellows, we've been learning about proven ways to promote traffic calming. One of the most powerful lectures I've seen so far was by the urban planner and author, Jeff Speck, who links social and environmental justice to making our communities more friendly for walkers, bikers, rollers. And his research shows that communities that enact traffic calming measures and slow traffic to 25 miles per hour or less obtain dramatic increases in the numbers of individuals walking, biking, and rolling. While you consider different traffic calming measures, I'd like to emphasize that reducing speed limits even a few miles an hour can be the difference between life and death for walkers, bikers, and rollers, particularly for our young children. I'm sure you've seen these statistics before, but I'll repeat them here. If an adult is struck by a motor vehicle traveling 40 miles per hour, they have a one in 10 chance of surviving. At 30 miles per hour, it goes to five in 10. At 20, they have a nine in 10 chance of surviving. This is a small change in speed limit, but it goes a long way to creating a safer and more equitable community for all of our members. Please, as keepers of the public way, as members of the town staff, Take action to make our streets safer, especially for our children. Adopt MGL Chapter 90, Section 17C and create 25 miles per hour throughout our community. Create a safety zone on Henry Street, create separate bike lanes for our schools, and dedicate resources to finalizing the bicycle and pedestrian plan. These are simple yet powerful actions that we can take today to make and create a more a, co <laughs> a culture of traffic calming and traffic awareness. Thank you for your time and your consideration. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, Becca Watkins, welcome. Hi, good morning. Thank you for uh, taking the time to uh, listen to the public. Um, excellent job, fifth graders. And I pretty much want to second everything that Jeremy said. Um, I just wanted to advocate my full support in adopting the townwide speed limit of 20 my five miles per hour, we'd be joining other towns such as Deerfield, Greenfield, and the city of Springfield in adopting this measure. I'd also like to strongly advocate for new speed limit signs to be put up in neighborhoods where existing 30 mile per, per hour signs are, along with speed radar signs, uh, much like Pelham and Hadley use and that we have on East Street. Um, I know that there are several neighborhoods in Amherst that have 30 mile per hour uh, limits, and we would love to see the reduction, uh, as well as some other traffic calming measures and the speed radar signs, I think would greatly help reinforce that. Um, thank you for considering the safety of our residents, and I really hope that we can move forward with seeing these changes. Thank you. Uh, Michelle Labby. I hope I, no, I, pronounced that correctly. You did. Thank you. Um, Michelle Abbey, North Amherst. And my comment is also regarding traffic and road safety. Um, the ability to use roads for non-motorized travel is a public right, quality of life issue, and a climate and sustainability issue, just as illustrated by the fifth graders and the commenters before me. Um, conversations about speeding problems in Amherst have been going on for years and years, and every solution seems to be met with naysaying and pessimism. And I've heard opposition recently to the townwide speed limit of 25 miles an hour due to lack of enforcement capability. But I really encourage you to be less pessimistic because the vast majority of people do follow the law. And if the speed limit is posted at 25, people will slow down and eventually a driving culture will change. Current speeds of 30 and 35 on online residential roads is really lethal and inappropriate. And yet people drive that fast simply because it's the posted speed limit and it's their legal right to do so but that's fixable. The town council has the ability to change the culture of road safety for our community roads if you exercise your power to do so. So please adopt a townwide speed limit of 25 miles per hour with posting. Please start making safety zones around playgrounds, preschools, and senior centers, and please in install separated bike lanes to allow children and community residents to bike to school. Thank you for considering these things. Thank you very much for being with us. Uh... Christine Lindstrom. 
Hello. Are you able to hear me? Yes, I can. Great. I can't quite tell if I'm on. Um, nice to meet you. My name's Christine Lindstrom. I am um, a mom in the public schools and I live downtown. Uh, we, when we moved here five years ago, we chose a downtown location so we could have more walking and biking in our lives. Um, and we ditched the second car. Um, so since that point, I've cared a lot about, um, alternative ways to get around Amherst in particular. Um, my kid started at Wildwood for a couple of years and most recently has been, um, going to the middle school for the past two years. Um, I joined the Transportation Advisory Committee and um, became familiar with the program through the Mass Department of Education or Department of Transportation called Safe Routes to School. Safe Routes to School is actually run federally through the Department of Transportation, but um, run here it, through MassDOT and then Massachusetts actually matches the funds and there's a pretty robust program around making communities walkable and bikeable for kids um, starting at our schools. Uh, that made a lot of sense to me since I, you know, have had concerns with my own child going on foot every day, especially on cello days uh, when she also has the giant cello going with her back and forth to school. Um, so I started the um, effort at working with um the superintendent's office to identify parents and run walk and bike to school days. Um, that's been surprisingly successful. I um, am overwhelmed and um, filled with gratitude at the number of parents who agree that we should and can be doing more to help our kids be able to get back and forth to school um, walking and biking. So um, we've had two highly successful walk and bike days. Um, so far, uh, we've engaged over 400 families, um, mostly at the elementary schools, but um, there are definitely kids who walk and bike at the high school and um, the middle school as well. And I think when it comes to an agenda specific to um, walking and biking to school, um, I will repeat a couple of things that are, I think, common sense solutions. One is that um, currently the middle school and the high school are not involved or are not um, school safety zones. So the town council can enroll the middle school and the high school in the school safety zone program, which means that do, during school hours, uh, when school is in, the speed limit is 20 miles an hour within a certain radius of those schools. So again, only our elementary schools in town are school safety zones, and there's no reason that the middle school and the high school should not have those additional protections. Um, the second is that we do have flashing school zone signs at our um, elementary schools, but they are only flashing, meaning, um, uh, alerting the um, or enforcing the 20 mile an hour um, speed limit during um, the beginning of the school when folks are arriving and then also during dismissal. So I think you heard the fifth graders say that they would prefer to have those on all day as a, as a traffic calming measure around the school for the whole day. Um, and I think we would agree or at least extend um, the hours in the morning around arrival as well as dismissal. And then last, um, the 25 mile an hour speed limit for the whole town makes a heck of a lot of sense because obviously kids are commuting other places on foot and on bike um, to art classes, to music lessons, uh, just to go downtown with their friends after school is over. So being able to have a slower speed limit throughout the town would give a lot of parents peace of mind. But it minim minimally, if we can't achieve that goal, at least in the short term, one um, suggestion is to make the Triangle Street speed limit consistent. 
to provide further protection in particular for the middle schoolers and high schoolers um, who are crossing. There's a crosswalk at Kellogg uh, right across from, uh, on Triangle, right across from the ball field. Um, that's a pretty scary place to cross. Steve, because... to, please please uh, draw to close because we do have to get on with the uh, other okay. things. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you very much. I'm sorry. And if you have additional comments, certainly provide them in writing. Uh, Rich McLean. Hello, thank you. Uh, I live on Alpine Drive. Uh, I'd like to offer my support to previous commenters advocating for adoption of a 25 mile an hour speed limit for the town and a greater incorporation of speed calming measures and walk and bike friendly infrastructure in our future road planning and improvement. Adopting these measures will make Amherst a more appealing and attractive place to live and work and a safer and more pleasant community in which to live. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for joining us. I think that uh, we have one more, Abby uh, Hobart. Can you hear? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, good. Sorry. I'm not very good at this. Um, I didn't prepare anything, but I, I just wanted to share. So I grew up on Flat Hills near the High Point neighborhood, and I now live just outside of Amherst Woods. And I I spend a lot of time on horseback up on Flat Hills and High Point, and then on bikes in the Amherst Woods uh, neighborhood. And I have noticed that these wide roads that don't have any lines down the middle and don't have posted uh, speed limit signs, I just take it for granted that many people, when they have to pass me with a small child on a pony or my seven-year-old on her bicycle, that they won't slow down. It, they just treat it like it's a one huge road just for them. And I do wonder if there were lines down the middle or if there are posted signs, if they would think a little harder about that. I, it is pretty scary out there. And also I was out biking yesterday in the um, Amherst Woods area. And it's true, the sidewalk, I mean, the sidewalks are um, overgrown. There are roots everywhere. And my daughter can't bike on the sidewalk. And then we go on the road and every time a car comes by, uh, she just has to move off and stand on the curb because there's pe most people don't slow down. They think if they just give us a wide berth, they can fly by at five miles per hour over the speed limit. And I, I also think if the speed limit was lower, most people, I mean, I shouldn't say most people, many people think they can drive five miles over the speed limit and it's, you know, that's just, it's okay. But if that were actually 15 miles per hour over the speed limit, they could get a significant ticket. So anything we can do to provide tra traffic calming measures, we, we think that the kids aren't out playing in Amherst Woods, we don't see them, but it's not safe for them out there. So. That is just my two cents in my experience. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for being with us. Um, I think we have uh, one more comment or request. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, uh, please uh, proceed. Hi, my name is Layla Mishabek and I, I live in uh, North Amherst off East Pleasant Street and I have um, a four-year-old and a seven-year-old uh, at, at Four River and at the Cushman Scott School. And I have noticed um, that this is, a, it's an issue that has impacted a lot of different areas. And I, and it certainly with my, taking my children to school, we are people who would really very much like to do that on foot or on bike. We, it is something that we, uh, we chose where we lived partially because of access to our kids' schools, to town, and yet I hesitate to do that uh, because like others before me have mentioned, it's really hard with, with small children who maybe aren't as confident on their bikes. Um, East Pleasant Street is incredibly busy and there's no sidewalks and there's no safe place to walk. The Cushman Scott uh, School is a, is a preschool where kids are in and out all the time and people barrel down that road. Um, and I have... I have been terrified to take to take my my kids to school on foot. And so I wanted to point out that in addition to this being, um, you know, an environment 
issue, a safety issue, a responsibility issue. I also think that that uh, it's an economic issue for our town because I I moved here from a city. I really like walking. I really like accessing um, downtown on foot or on bike and like wandering in and out of shops of a Saturday afternoon with my kids or whatever it is, or going to a coffee shop. And that's something that we really, we don't do as much because it doesn't feel safe with our, for our family. And so I feel like making, prioritizing a, a safer and more um, pedestrian and cyclist friendly um, throughways in the town would would actually encourage people to pass through the town a lot more and engage with like local businesses and 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 each other and community activities and so for me um it really just has a lot of uh, a lot of different benefits and it it feels like something to prioritize thank you i appreciate your comments and uh I want to thank everybody who's spoken from the public about all again consistent with the issues that we will be addressing in a few minutes uh, when we get to the uh, corp that part of the agenda. Um, I do need to um, take us on a different direction for a moment. However, um, Paul Bachman, our town manager, is with us and. Uh, Paul, you have a presentation you want to make on some appointments that you need to get to the council. So I'll turn it to you. Thank you, Andy. Um, so and Melissa Laducey Walker is here too. Melissa, are you there? Yeah, you are. In multiple formats. We can't hear you though. You're muted. We'll figure that out. Anyway, I'll move forward since I know your time is running. So I have three appointments that I'm presenting to you today. Um, uh, the first is um, Alex Cox to a uh, two-year term for the Affordable Housing Trust. Um, the trust is looking for members. You may know Alex Cox as members of the as a um, council because he attends many of your town council meetings. Uh, he's a, a graduate student at UMass, has many several more years available to him to continue his um to get to his degree, very interested in affordable housing and has attended some affordable housing meeting, trust meetings as well. So I think he'll be a strong candidate. He was interviewed by the um, by our normal cop bodies. And so he's uh, an appointment for that committee. And the other person is Alexander Niefer for the um, Board of Assessors. The board um, is always looking for members. It's probably the one of the least glamorous, most important boards in the town. Uh, and so this is a major commitment by the um, by a person who's getting on because they actually have to go to school and get certified to be able to be a, an assessor. So we always encourage people who are interested in making a long-term commitment. Alexander owns a house um, in South Amherst, but is also developing a farm in North Amherst. So that's kind of um, a new perspective that the board doesn't have right now. And the third appointment is, is uh, a permanent full-time position, which is a town department head, and the council ha uh, has the authority to approve or disapprove uh, these appointments as well. The, the um, person I'm appointing is Melissa Zawitsky. Uh, Melissa has had a long career in public finance in Western Massachusetts. She started in uh, as an assistant treasurer in the city of Northampton. She has worked in um, a number of other communities, including Agawam, Palmer, Southbridge, um, and was finance director in East Hampton. Most recently, she is a senior um, vice president, uh, senior director of human resources at UMass Auxiliary Enterprises, which includes all the food services and things like that. You know, this has been a, we, we have a history of really strong uh, finance directors with Sandy Pooler, and with um, John Lusanti, and most recently with Sean Mangano, and getting people of high caliber to serve for the town in this high profile position, it's been a real challenge. And so we're really grateful that Melissa, um, she wasn't necessarily looking for this position, but I reached out to her and, um, and she has agreed to take this on. So I think this is a really good appointment for us. She's met our entire finance team, which includes, you know, Holly Drake, the comptroller, Jen LaFountain, our treasury collector, and Kim Yu, our principal assessor. Um, they feel like she'll be a great teammate for them. And so um, I ask for your support so the council will ultimately support this appointment. 
So let me open it up to members of the committee to see if anybody has uh, questions about any of the appointments that uh, have been recommended and or uh, and Melissa, if you have any additional comments, please make them uh, also. So I've rejoined by my phone. Thank you for your patience with me. Um, I didn't hear everything that Paul said, but I just wanted to say that I think we're very fortunate to have Melissa on board with us. She has a breadth of uh, financial leadership and uh, municipal experience as well over 20 years. And um, it's been a long process to on the search to find the right person, but I think we're there. And so um, I, I think we're making a great decision. Well, thank you. I would encourage the decision. Thank you. Committee members, uh, any questions? George, did you have a chance? Uh, uh, Jennifer, go ahead. No, I just wanted to, um, I guess, <laughs> congratulate Melissa and Paul. I know it's, it's, um, that's a great feeling when you reach out to someone. Is that someone that you, you know, certainly thought would be, you know, an excellent candidate for the position. And when they agree to step up and take it on, that's a good feeling. So I know this has been, um, somebody actually told me, I think we at the MMA conference that we should encourage young people we know to go into municipal finance because there's a real need and um, the demand outweighs, I guess, the supply at this point. So that's great. You got um, someone that you, uh, you know, really thought was was perfect for the role. Yeah, and I, to that point, I mean, we, the uh, MMA has started, you know, we, we started a few years ago when I was at the MMA, we started a certificate in local government and management and leadership. But more recently, they started a, a similar program, a companion program just for municipal finance to get people who are like in the mid-level career to start thinking about it. One of the sort of honestly, the sad things was that we have two really you know, strong people who would be able to step up. Jen LaFountain, our treasure collector, and Holly Drake, our comptroller. <clears throat> they weren't willing to take on the task. Um, not like, you know, they, they were just like clear from day one that they were, that's not the position that they wanted to take on because of the demands on the position. So I do think that there's high expectations. Um, it's a high profile position and you, you know, there's a, it's a public position and a lot of people just don't want to take that on. And I think that's, that's a, hazard we have as a community and how this how we handle our our, our key staff. Thank you. George, did you uh, write any uh, motions for today? Um, I am prepared to make a motion if uh, if that's what you're asking. But no, I do not have a written motion, but I have a draft in front of me I'm, I, I use when I make motions. Big, uh, if you want to do that. So I'm prepared to uh, move to recommend that the town council approve the town manager appointment of of Melissa Zadwatsky uh, to the position of finance director as posted uh, with the town clerk as filed with the town clerk on May 28th, 2024. Is there a second? Uh, I'll second. Yeah, there's a motion that's been made and seconded. Uh, there's no further discussion requested. I'll Go ahead and proceed to a vote. Uh, Councillor Ryan? Aye. Uh, Jennifer Tao? Yes. Bob Hagner? Aye. Uh, Council Lord? Aye. And I'm a yes. So the, the, the is unanimous. George, uh, two other requests. You're muted, George. You're muted, George. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Um, I'm prepared to make a motion. I move to recommend the town council approve the town manager appointment of Alex Cox to the Affordable Housing Trust Board of Trustees as filed with the town clerk on May 28th, 2024 for a two-year term that will expire on June 30, 2026. Second. Motion made and seconded. Um, to begin to vote. Uh, Councillor uh, Ryan. Aye. Uh, Jennifer Taub. Yes. Uh, Bob Hegner. Aye. 
Council Park. Aye. And I'm an aye, so that again, it's unanimous. And I think there was one other recommended appointment. So I'm prepared to make a motion. Um, I move that the town council approve the town manager appointment of Alexander Niefer to the Board of Assessors um, as filed with the town clerk on May 28, 2024 for a three-year term, effective July 1st, 2024, and expiring on June 30, 2027. Second. Motion has been made and seconded. Uh, we'll proceed to a vote. Uh, Councilor Ryan? Aye. Uh, Jennifer Taub? Yes. Uh, Bob Hagner? Aye. Councilor Lord? Yep. Aye. And I'm an aye, so that again, it is unanimous. So, uh, Paul and Melissa, thank you for thank you. being here. And I don't know if you, Paul, you probably, uh, you're telling me you had to go back to your conference now. So, and otherwise, but I'll watch the recording. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, we, um, then are ready to proceed to our other agenda items. And uh, this is a, um, I just want to thank uh, uh, Chief Ting, um, DW, um, Superintendent Mooring, Town Engineer, uh, Jason Skeels for all joining us because they have a wealth of expertise from the management side of our police and um, public works departments about um, the subjects that we've heard a lot about this morning, starting with uh, uh, students at school who are talking about their own safety and the, of their friends. And uh, so it's really great to have you present. And I think that it's really important that uh, we all find a way that um, creatively um, the staff of the town and the council can work together to find solutions to what is obviously a matter of great concern to our community as we've heard today. Uh, George, your hand is up. I didn't know if that was uh, from before, or if you had something that you wanted to start the discussion with. I guess I had a question, Andy, about, and I apologize for raising this, but um, the order in which you want to do things. Um, we have a general discussion, um, and then we have a series of specific items. And given the expertise we have present in the room, um, I guess I'm just asking you whether it makes sense to start with something specific like uh, the Market Hill Road, the Henry Street uh, issue, um, and getting input from the experts present. Um, I guess I'm just wondering what order you want to do this in and what makes the most sense given the time that we have and the, and the people we have present. I think that I would, um, I would recommend that we start with a little bit of a general presentation because there's one piece and uh, the Chief uh, Ting might be able to help us as I you know that he's made a present, he's talked about this for many years. And actually, uh, came up a little bit in the finance committee meeting too. And that is, uh, there's a relationship between speed limits and uh, compliance with speed limits and ability to enforce speed limits. And uh, when you read the material that is presented by uh, Mass DOT regarding their speed limit policies and what the town is permitted to do, uh, you know, it all comes down to the question in the end about compliance and enforcement. And so, Chief, I don't know if you have anything that you want to start us off with about your experience in this area. Uh, sure. Well, you know, certainly uh, the Cushman area, you know, that's been um that's been studied and it's been looked into. And I know there's been a lot of concern, certainly with the uh, daycare being located right there in uh, the child center. Um, so we have uh, looked extensively, especially with uh, Dr. Jeremy Anderson, who was uh, 
who was uh, with public comment earlier today. He's been leading that charge to try and find solutions um, that would work for everybody. Um, I know that their, their situation is a little bit unique simply because they have parking on both sides of the street that kind of presents a challenge, uh, especially during drop-off and pickup times. Um, so with that being said, we had uh, we had our officers conduct a speed study to try and determine, you know, if there was an issue there with speed and which in which direction was it coming from. Uh, so we had uh, conducted about a, a two-week study uh, at different time periods that were specific to uh, drop-off times and pickup times. And, you know, the, the data did show that um, uh, the most part, for the most part, uh, the speeding wasn't a huge issue, but there were definitely uh, speeders um, and people who did not respect the fact that there is a daycare in that area. Uh, so it did present a problem. Uh, so there were a lot of different options that were uh, being explored. And certainly uh, I know that the DPW has been in on these conversations uh, relative to um, speed calming measures or traffic calming measures, you know, potentially changing the route of the road or uh, additional stop signs or perhaps uh, some speed bumps. So all of those different measures have been discussed and, um, you know, unfortunately, we have not come to a conclusion yet. So I think that's why we're here. Uh, but certainly safety is is paramount, you know, especially for our children. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and again, uh, members of the committee, please uh, don't hesitate at any time to raise hands because if you have follow up questions as uh, to, to make our uh, lead, leadership in our uh, police department on DPW, let us know. Bob? Yeah, I just wanted to make an observation that I, I live just off of uh, Wildflower Road, and um, a constituent complained to me personally, and I went over and talked to him. And um, there's a lot of speeding down Wildflower, especially the the newer, the section that was repaved, people go really fast down that, uh, coming down the hill there. And there's a four-way stop sign at Wildflower and Larkspur. And I know that the, the police have been monitoring that, but people are running through the stop signs all the time. Um, mm -hmm. And we, we discussed whether, you know, right now the speed limit is 30 on Wildflower. Uh, if, if it were reduced to 25, um, you know, I, I pointed out that, People are going to speed no matter what, <laughs> what's posted. But um, the you know I think that would be a positive step if we could if we could reduce uh, the speed limits. So I, I have a question about um, adoption of MGL Chapter ninety. Uh, we can wait till that section of the thing. But the question I, I have is whether um, it would apply to all town-owned roads or we could change. The speed limit like on on um, 116 in that space around um, the Hitchcock Center the current speed limit now is 50 um, would it be would we have to reduce it to 25 or could that be uh, an exception a posted exception um, so I know the state ro roads are different but I don't know if that I think that's not a state road so uh, anyway that, that it, it, it can wait till we talk about that but um, I did have that question Gilford, did you have your hand up? Or... I can, I'll wait until we talk about that topic. Okay. Yeah, because I think that the question uh, that you're raising about uh, that particular statutory provision is something that we need, we, we need to come back to. Jennifer? In the... uh, let me, let's uh, let Chief Ting Chief. I'm sorry. Thank you, Jennifer. I just wanted to address uh, something that Bob had talked about when he spoke about the Amherst Woods uh, situation with that stop sign. Uh, and I'm not sure if it's the same resident that that probably brought it up to you. Uh, that, But we did have a resident with a signed petition from people living in that neighborhood talking specifically about that stop sign um, 
and there's a lot of safety concerns with with pedestrians and children in the area. So we did conduct a study there too, um, which we have also conducted a speed study in the past years ago for specifically for wildflower in that uh, area. Um, so we have discovered uh, a few different things. You know, we weren't quite sure, you know, where the speeders were coming from. Is it being used as a cut through? Is it a transient population or is it really internal? And we found that uh, a lot of them, a lot of it is from internal. And I think that that's human nature where you're so familiar with your surroundings and your own neighborhood, you just kind of disregard things at times. Um, so it has been a disheartening situation because we did have some measures where we had community involvement, neighborhood involvement, where we had children in that neighborhood that had erected signs, you know, asking uh, the neighborhood to please slow down and to be cognizant of that. And unfortunately, those signs were just recently vandalized, um, which is really, really troubling for us. Uh, but we are, we're not gonna allow that to dissuade us. We're gonna continue to have our neighborhoods to uh, erect more signs, and we are going to have some measures to try and figure out who's causing this vandalism. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Chief. Jennifer, back to you. Yeah, a couple of things. First, I didn't know uh, Tracy Zafian, who's chair of a uh, TAC, is in the audience. I didn't know if we maybe want to bring her into the discussion. I think that'd be fine if as a uh, panelist. Um, so I wanted to ask, uh, so the chief said that you know, we were here to discuss measures we would want to begin to adopt, certainly around the Cushman uh, Scott School and then the other schools in Amherst. So will we be able to actually make some recommendations today? I know we've been talking about this for a long time, and we have had the study done for adopting speed limits um, or making that a special speed limit zone around the Cushman Scott School. School, are we at a point now where we, you know, could begin, could vote to make a recommendation to the council so that we can bring some relief specifically to that location? And then the other recommendations that we heard this morning were that in addition to adopting a 25 mile per hour speed limit throughout town, and I had the same question would that apply to state roads like 116? But um, also, you know, the uh, the recommendation that we have flashing lights around the schools for extended hours. Um, and then specifically, I guess, for the Kellogg Triangle Street, I know that's, well, one side of the street is in my district and that is a pretty treacherous, it's, it's right by the high school and that's a pretty treacherous uh, street to cross. So it seems like, so there, there's several sort of tranches of recommendations, but can we, or suggestions and requests from the community that how can we actually begin to decide what we're gonna to recommend to be done? And so I'd like to be able to move to some action items beyond a discussion if, if we can do that. There are three things that we can come back to um, and make specific recommendations about. One is to, uh, Henry Street, Second is we can talk about uh, Chapter 9017C and uh, whether that is something to consider. And there are some uh, limitations on what that will do, but uh, there are some very positive things about what that might do also. So those are two things. And then um, we also should uh, make a final decision regarding Heatherstone. So, uh, because there was this very specific proposal on that. So I do think we want to move there. I wanted to see if there were any general um, thoughts about it, because as I look at the problem, part of it is there uh, is the started out with the safe routes to school and the concerns raised by the students at uh, Fort River. Uh, we can't provide um, safe uh, streets or state uh, sidewalks for them to use for riding that we don't have, we haven't solved that problem. And uh, the uh, current bylaw does allow 
uh, riding of bicycles on sidewalks, except in uh, the downtown and business district. And uh, I know people from the uh, Commission Disabilities, former Disability Access Advisory Committee, have concerns about uh, bicycles on sidewalks and the effect on population that they're concerned about. So that does create tensions. Anything else, Jennifer? Oh, just about if uh, Tracy could come in as a panelist. I think she might. Uh, Athena, can you do that? And uh, I, I did click the button to promote her, but she just has to. Oh, here we go. Here she's coming. Thank you. OK. Tracy, hi, welcome. Uh, so we'll come back to you. But George? Councilor Ryan. Yeah, thanks, Andy. We have sort of two. We have two specific uh, issues before us: Heatherstone Road and um, Henry Street. But then we have um, this issue of Chapter 90, uh, 17C, which is a townwide uh, proposal, if I understand that correctly. So I guess what I'd like to hear from uh, the the experts here. Um, if something like that happened, what would would they think this is a good idea, a bad idea? I think there's a pretty strong sense that amongst many of the people that talk to us and, and amongst some of the things we've been reading, that lowering speed limits is a great idea. Um, here's a proposal to lower it pretty much townwide. Um, but is I mean, I'm wondering, given the experience of, of, Cap, of Captain Ting and or, excuse me, uh, Chief Ting and, 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 and Jason and Guilford and others, um, what do they think? They think this is a good idea, bad idea. Is it, it would it really make any difference? Um, what would be the impact of a change like that? Gilford? So I'll, I'll kind of start off just to address chapters 17, chapter 90, section 17C. That does not uniformly, if you approve it, it does not across the board, reduce the speed limit on every road in Amherst to 25. It does not do that. It will lower the roads that have no posted speed limit to 25. So you were talking about 116 in front of the Hitchcock School, that will stay 50. Any road that has a posted speed limit or as they call it, a, a regulatory speed limit, that speed will stay. You will just take the roads that don't have a posted speed limit, the default, well, I call default statutory speed limit, that will go down to 25. So that's what that does. And I'll just leave that at that. So that clears that one thing up and then we can talk about the rest. Hmm. Yeah, I've had, uh, it, it's a complex process and uh, uh, you or Jason might want to, explain the process a little bit better, but uh, I had this discussion with the resident who lives on Northeast Street where it's 45 miles an hour, and uh, it's a complex process that requires that uh, the town request a, a speed study and um, you have to obtain um, consent from the Department of Transportation to change those speed limits. It's not a simple or brief process. Jennifer? But we've had the study, if we wanted to recommend reducing the speed limit on Henry Street by the Cushman Scott School, we could do that. That's what, and I thought in the study, another <clears throat> recommendation, which seemed very doable is could the parking lot that's across the street from the school on Henry Street, where now parents park and have to cross the street, could that be staff parking? So parents could park right next to the school on the west side of Henry Street. But it sat it's, um, from the study, the study's been done. So could that's just this, my question. Could we even today recommend uh, reduce speed limit by the Cushman Scott School. Yes, and I think that we're going to be, uh, we probably should segue to the three things that we can actually 
focus on two one at a time. Uh, let me see what uh, Councilor Ryan has to say, and then let's uh, focus on uh, Henry Street first. So I guess what what I'm hearing or what I what I'm getting from this is that an attempt to do a kind of town wide uh, change is is really premature and has a whole host of challenges and questions related to it. And that's not something we can get through today. Um, but if we look at specific uh, issues, mm -hmm. like for instance, Henry Street, we have a report, um, as Jennifer's pointed out, it makes some specific recommendations. It does seem to support, as I read it, creating a safety zone. It does make some other suggestions that um, uh, related to obviously stricter enforcement, traffic calming. Um, Jennifer mentioned the parking lot. Um, and it, it clearly says a multi-way stop is not appropriate. So um, that's something we could move on, but it has a number of other pieces to it that I'm not sure we can resolve today. Um, do we also want to uh, uh, recommend a, a traffic calming? Do we want to um, suggest that there be stricter enforcement? Is that even possible? Um, do we want to recommend eliminating the parking? Um, so uh, there's a bunch of pieces to that, and I'm not sure we're going to get through all of them today, but it seems that Henry Street, clearly this study supports um, doing something. Um, as far as Heatherstone, I think we're pretty much in agreement. I don't think there's a big issue with that, um, though my other co my colleagues will have to speak up. But I think with Henry, we do have some challenges that maybe we can resolve some of them now. Um, how much can we recommend? How much makes sense to recommend? Um, that's, I guess, my question. Jennifer? Yeah, well, I, I'd love to hear the responses to George's question. Maybe uh, could, if I could also ask, what would be the process and would does staff agree that speed bumps could be helpful on Henry Street as well? Well, let's see if, uh, let's turn focus very singly on Henry Street for um, and see if we can get to a resolution to any parts of it. Um, Guilford or Jason, uh, you worked uh, with the engineer who did the consultant report, and I don't know if uh, either of you have uh, things that you would like to emphasize from the report. Uh, and that, because I think we could move forward and uh, that would affect the lowering of the speed limit, but I don't know what other additional things that we could do to augment the speed limit uh, change if we did that, such as signage or uh, installation of automatic sign, uh, radar signs or anything like that. And I uh, also wanted to ask, uh, Tracy, if uh, the Transportation Advisory Committee had a recommendation. So, so I'll, I'll jump in. Um, so you have the study. It was done by a CDM, CDM Smith. Um, they recommend, yes, you can put a safety zone at Cushman um, on Henry Street. They do recommend that there be more than just a safety zone. They do recommend that there be more enforcement. They do recommend some traffic calming, and they do recommend moving things around and reshuffling the area. Um, put, if you vote to put the safety zone in place, we can do that relatively quickly. It's a matter of buying signs, uh, which we actually don't have money for. It's not budgeted, but we can do that. Um, <clears throat> the other thing would be that we need to then look into what type of traffic calming you want to do. And the traffic coming would take a bit of time to work out how to do it. There is not, <clears throat> there's not very much drainage in the area. It's kind of an old road. It has country drainage as we, as we call it. So we'd have to do some drainage improvements. We'd have to do some design work, which is not something we can whip, we can turn around very quickly. So that would be a long term and probably wouldn't be ready for the sidewalks and all that, wouldn't be ready for next year's construction season. But if you approve the safety zone, then that can go in relatively soon. And the flashing uh, driver feedback signs can go in and then we can go from there. 
Okay, Tracy, did you, you uh, there was a recommendation from Transportation Advisory Committee? I mean, there had been back when the committee originally reviewed it um, with the previous council. Um, I mean, we were waiting to see the what the report would show. And I'm just looking at the report today for the first time. I mean, we do in general think that it's not sufficient just to change the speed limit, that you actually need to have like traffic calming measures as well. Um, and I do have just a related question for Captain Ting, just in terms of, you know, in terms going back to some of the more general discussion about speed limits and enforcement and so on. Like I do know that right, you did have officers out at Henry Street, like collecting the data. Um, and then at Wildflower Drive, you've had people doing enforcement and doing ticketing or warnings. I'm not sure what you were giving out, but I mean, just, you know, realistically, you know, what is the capacity of the department to do more, spend more time on enforcement? And also just related, relatedly, you know, I was just curious about like how often the department does issue warnings or tickets or like if you track that kind of data. Um, so. So to answer your question, Tracy, yeah, absolutely. You know, I think that's, uh, you know, when we're talking about changing speed limits, um, speed limits are only as good as uh, as the enforcement, essentially. Um, you know, because if, if we've learned anything since the pandemic, you know, when the pandemic happened, you know, all enforcement, a lot of enforcement had slowed down because we were trying to limit um, certainly contact uh, with the general public as well as, uh, you know, for the safety of our officers and the safety of the community at large. Um, and we learned real quickly that without enforcement, uh, you just see speeders, just uh, they, they recognize there's not a lot of officers making stops. So the speeding is just gonna become rampant. So that's something that we we took from that pandemic and we learned from that pretty quickly. Um, so certainly with enforcement here in the town of Amherst, I think that speeding and traffic issues is probably the number one complaint that we receive here at the police department. That's townwide, not just at Cushman, not just at, at Amherst Woods, it's literally all over town um, that there's issues with traffic complaints and speeders. Um, you know, I just got one on Southeast Street and certainly Bay Road is a hot, hot street because it's a, it's a long straightaway and that's just a constant. And unfortunately, we just don't have the resources to stretch us out um, on, a, on any consistent basis to be able to enforce speed in, a, in, in any one particular area. Um, because we, we do have to respond to calls and we're tied up on many other things as well. So that lack of consistency, I think, is going to affect the sustainability of any type of real enforcement on any particular street. So that is, is very limited. So I just want everyone to be aware of that. No, thank you. That's helpful. I mean, and I will say too, um, I think one of the things that was just mentioned, maybe it was also in the report. I'm sorry, I haven't looked through the report that thoroughly yet, but just the idea of the radar speed signs. I know when the Transportation Advisory Committee considered, you know, Henry Street and what possible changes could be made there, we did recommend having those signs. Mm -hmm. You know, I have been CC'd on a number of different emails that have come in and requests from residents about that they would like to have them too. Um, but what we found is that there was a comprehensive USDOT study just done a few years ago that found that they do have, like, they can have longer term effects um, mm -hmm. and that they will lead to um, lower lower travel speeds, like even if they are removed, like even if they are temporary ones. So, um, and yeah, I see I, that, I see that in my own street, like I live on yeah. off of Amity Street and um, I do see, this is just not really a question just for you, Captain King, which is a comment, yeah. but like for the committee in general, but it does seem you know, they can have longer term impacts, you know, it's whereas some of, the, some of the mass DOT, like previously had thought they wouldn't, but the, um, the more recent USDOT research shows that they can. So. so I would I would agree with you. I think that uh, environmental design is and traffic calming measures is probably the most effective, rather than uh, just enforcement and just a speed sign alone. Um, I think it's a lot more effective. Uh, you know, I, just as an example, I just drove through Long Meadow the other day, and if you look at Long Meadow, the streets, the sidewalks are far back and they're wide enough for pedestrians as well as 
uh, bicycles. So unfortunately, we don't have that luxury in our streets. You know, this is um, that's something I don't know if they they had planned in their city in their town, um, but they have much wide open lanes. Um, they're a lot more conducive for pedestrian traffic, and so it keeps the the cars on the road and the people in the and the bikes off the road. And that's I think that's one thing that we're struggling with uh, within our community. So Captain King, so for the um the portable radar speed signs, mm -hmm. like as I was saying, you know, I was CC'd on some different requests. People say, oh, I need it here. We need it here. I was actually mm -hmm. curious about how many the town owns and how much they get moved around. Just so that maybe people understand that you can't have them in all the neighborhoods, <laughs> for example. <laughs> Right. So uh, I think I think Gilfrey can answer that. Oh, okay, um, great. I wasn't sure who where they live, but thanks, Gilfrey. So we actually sent the count the TSO and their package, a document from Mass DOT, which talks about speed limit zone, setting speed limits and the things we're talking about today. And in the back on the last page, they talk about the driver feedback signs. And they actually say don't put them everywhere. Everyone's asking for them everywhere. Only put them at certain places. Places Don't populate them. So if you read the guidance from Mass DOT, every one of our signs that we've placed so far is in the wrong place. Uh, and they would Mass DOT would not recommend them to be there. We have one on Southeast Street. We have one on Amity Street. And we have one on North Pleasant Street up by uh, Puff, Puffton Village. So... Um, that's those are signs we put in before guidance started to come out about how to how to place them and use them a little more effectively. But really, they don't want those signs kind of populated everywhere. They say you really shouldn't have them populated everywhere. Where do they and where would they put it, or where would you put it using those guidelines? You would put them in school zones, in transition zones, approaches to signalized intersections on high speed roads, and in work zones. So now have you actually also, like for the locations where they're currently located, has the DPW collected any data about, like if they have had any impact on the speeds there? Because just anecdotally as somebody who lives off of Amity, like I do see people responding when they, when those signs are blinking at them and telling people to slow down. So, but I haven't done like a full data study on that. No, we're working with the vendor to actually figure out how to download the data. The data does get stored in there for a little while, but then you have to do a drive-by or, or a parking, park next to it and download it in. And we haven't really figured that out. And he hasn't been able to, the, the, we have the early generation signs. So we think there's a little data glitch in there to, to download the data. Jennifer? Mm. Yeah, so I wanted to, ask about speed bumps. I don't know if that's still the technical term, but are they effective? Um, we got them on my street about, I don't know, 10 years ago, and they seem to be effect. They have been effective, at least they were initially. Um, and what is the, pro if, if so, and if it would be appropriate by the Cushman Scott School, does a street kind of get in the queue? I mean, how would that work? And I, you might, that may have been the drainage was that in response to the speed bumps, the drainage issue on the street? Yes. When we, if we were to put a speed hump or speed table or a raised crosswalk at Cushman, it would be part of the overall design for traffic calming. And yes, we'd have to, when you raise up the section of the road, then you have to kind of accommodate that drainage where it's going to go. And... So if, so how would we get to, if we wanted to make a recommendation and what would be the timing and what is the process? Well, I assume if you make the recommendation that you want to make the safety zone and then say you also want to pursue pursue speed, uh, investigating more traffic calming and so forth, that we would just take it on and we'd work it in, into the packet for the what we work on over the fall here and then try to have something in the spring. Okay. Thank you. That's all right. Someone could correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe in the report uh, that uh, we were given, um, we would need to extend 
the length of the safety zone by a certain amount of feet. Is that correct? Uh, so the, the I was thinking of making a motion, but I think uh, if I remember the report correctly, and I'm sorry, I don't have it in detail in front of me, but there was some thought that we'd have to have an extension of the, the area of the safety zone. So any motion would have to be uh, uh, include that language. Am I correct about that? Or does it matter? Maybe it doesn't matter. Uh, if I re could recommend, I would recommend that you accept the, or approve a speed zone in accordance with the study by CDM Smith with the dates on it, and that we would use that as to set how we set the speed area. Okay. I'm prepared to make that motion, but um, I need to hear from the chair and from my colleagues uh, if, uh, what their thoughts are. Um, I'd also like us to get to Heather Stone if we can before uh, time runs out. Um, so do people want uh, me to try and craft a motion on the fly along the lines of what Guilford suggested, um, which essentially would be that we would recommend to the council that they adopt the recommendations in the, uh, the report uh, of that specific date and leave it at that. Um, is that, would that be sufficient? Yes, it would be the recommendation to create a safety zone for a portion of Henry Street in accordance with the report from CDM Smith with the date. Well, if that's a motion, I'd be prepared to second it. Jennifer, Jennifer would be. Well, I just had a question, maybe. I have to ask it after it's motion seconded. Hey, George, go ahead and make the motion. If you well, want. Andy, you, you actually just articulated it. So if you could articulate it again, um, I think I would take that as the motion and then I would second it because I'm not sure I can repeat it in exactly the way you did it. It's not that complicated, but you did it perfectly, as I recall. So essentially, if you could just repeat what you just said, um, I would be happy to second that. I'm going to have to go back and uh, look at the transcript myself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. That uh, we would uh, recommend to the council an adoption of a safety zone for a portion of Henry Street as recommended in the CDM uh, report. And Athena can find the date for that. If, yeah. and we could um, uh, uh, the, the exact delineation of the beginning and the end uh, would need to be determined. Yeah, it's in the report. It's in the report, yes. The date is March uh, 15th. Thank you, Kilfin. So, so I'm that, prepared to second that motion. Okay, then we'll treat it as a motion on the floor. Any comments about it? Uh, and that doesn't uh, deal with um, any decision yet about uh, traffic calming. But uh, Jennifer, before we go to a vote. So can we have a follow-up motion about traffic calming? Since we've been told that the speed limit alone unless you're going to have, you know, really vigorous enforcement is, is not going to, is not a um, comprehensive enough solution. So we have to have traffic calming measures, you know, together with the uh, speed limits. So would that be a separate measure or is that part of what's recommended? Is it clear that that's part of what is recommended in the report that we would like to, you know, be in, we, we would like to continue looking at what and, and do it with some urgency that this isn't just something that gets sort of on a long list, but it's on a short list for traffic calming measures to be coupled with the uh, reduced speed limit. So I guess what I'm asking, is that a separate measure? Or is that included in adopting the recommendations in the report? Um, feel free to turn back to you, but my thought is, is that uh, we would need a recommendation back from you and Jason about uh, whether there is effective traffic calming that you could recommend and uh, what that might be. It would be hard to have us 
uh, be the ones to initially develop a traffic calming strategy as, uh, as it's uh, included in the report. George? Yeah, I think what this motion is doing is giving uh, Guilford and his people um, the leeway to make their professional judgment. What we're saying to the council is that we recommend that you create a safety zone uh, as spelled out in the report and uh, and the rest of it is going to be left up to uh, Guilford to use his judgment as to what uh, of the recommendations he can uh, can uh, take. And if I guess if later in this process, we feel like we have to add more to it, we can come back to it. But I think at this point, I think we just want to get this, get the ball rolling um, and, and trust in the judgment and expertise of our DPW um, based on this report which does include many of the things that uh, have been discussed, including traffic calming, stricter enforcement, and suggestions about parking. Um, we're not going to pass a motion on all that. Um, we are simply uh, endorsing this report and asking DPW to then use their judgment to 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 bring it about. And we just need the council's approval. I do, by the way, do do they need also to adopt MGL ninety eighteen B or is that did we already do that? I can't remember. Um, have Actually, we done that? Yeah, you need to adopt that as well, or else you can't do right. this. Right, okay. but fine. That's but that's something we can sort out uh, before the council. Whatever I think, the motion is fine as it stands, and it's basically giving DPW the uh, you know the, the freedom to do what they think is best based on the report. Uh, I've turned to Athena on this one, but I think the council may have done the adoption. Yes, Andy, the council did adopt it in the fall of 2023. It came before the council and TSO recommended it, and then it was adopted. That's what I thought. So we did adopt the statute, So, but we uh, we haven't adopted the, say, the specific zone. It was just, it created the ability to do that. George? Yes, so opting into that. Um, allows allows the creation of safety zones that meet the standards. So the action would lower the speed limit for that section to 20, but uh, uh, the specific additional actions regarding uh, safety measures would have to be separate actions. Yeah. And so, in the memo you got from the town manager concerning Cushman and, and these zones, the town attorney reviewed the documentation and the everything has been done so far by the town, and he did not find where that had happened. So if you read that memo from the town manager, and it is a memo from the town council, town attorney, sorry, confusing, uh, the town attorney says that his review did not find that the town council had taken that action. But was that town, I believe that memo from the town attorney was prior to it being considered by the council in the fall, unless it's, it was an updated memo. Because if you look at the um, carryover memo from the previous TSO, it says that on September 14, 2023, TSO recommended the council adopt the provisions of MGL Chapter 90, Section 18B, and the council action on October 2nd, 2023 was to accept the provisions of um, Chapter 90, Section 18B, establishment of the designated safety zones. So, yeah. so yeah. I believe that, that that was when I believe that the town manager consulted the town attorney prior to that discussion and action by the council, but I may not have the latest information. Yeah, uh, Tina, I don't know if you have anything to add. <clears throat> I'm just checking. I'm I'm fairly sure they the council did adopt chapter ninety section eighteen B, but I'm confirming that now. Okay, George. But I think we still can go ahead um, if it turns out that we haven't adopted it that's something the council will have to do um but i have a feeling we probably have um but we can still move ahead i think with the motion it's on the floor it's been seconded um uh, i don't see any reason why we can't vote on it uh but we don't have the authority to uh 
council is of the authority to take the action unless it's already taken the prior action of adopting the statute. So that creates a little bit of a dilemma. Um, then, uh, trying to think of a procedural, uh, can we just have an agreement to, uh, um, Andy, if I if I can suggest that you move forward with the motion that's on the floor and it looks like, I'm sorry, I'm just finding it now. October 2nd, council accepted the provisions of chapter 90, section 18B. Okay, then uh, we're correct and we're ready to go and uh, I'll proceed to a vote on the motion on the floor, Councilor Ryan. Aye. Um, uh, Jennifer Taub. Yes. Uh, Bob Hegner. Aye. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, are you? I don't know if, uh, as the Lord has uh, stepped away from her computer for the moment. Yeah. I will... Lord, I. Lord, I thank you very much, and I'm an I. So the vote is unanimous on that. And uh, then let's uh, turn to Heather Stone. And uh, is there anything more to be said about Heather Stone? Was, uh, I sent you the um a very brief report from disability access advisory committee or commission uh disability commission as it uh, was renamed uh tracy do you have anything to report further from tac no um as i had mentioned uh to you andy at the last TAC meeting that the TAC voted to recommend the three main elements of the Heatherstone changes in the town's proposal, including the removal of the planter median islands, um, construction of the new sidewalk from Pelham Road to the north intersection of the Heatherstone Aubinwood, and then also the addition of the mini roundabouts. Um, and in our discussion, I mean, it was made clear that the original memo from the town manager and the superintendent of public works, like when they talked about the mini roundabouts being 90 to, f I mean, 50 to 90 feet in diameter, that that was much larger than the town was actually looking at. That what was described to us by the DPW is that they would be five to six feet in diameter, which I believe is just the inner diameter and it doesn't include the travel lanes. But again, it's like a much, it's at least like half as small. Um, the TAC, we did have some comments, just like other related comments. I sent the memos sort of late this morning, but, you know, just in general, like following up on some of the themes that were raised by the Fort River fifth graders about safe routes to school and continue to improve on Delta Town Road. You know, we understand that it's harder to make improvements to the sidewalk along Pelham Road, just given the very narrow width there. Um, we did think that, you know, if the mini roundabouts are not that effective, that it would be helpful to look at additional traffic calming measures there. Um, you know, one issue that came up is that, um, and, and this was mentioned, you know, both in some of the meetings, but one thing is like currently, you know, residents do want to see the road repaved, but they are concerned that once the road is repaved and the potholes are gone, that cars will speed more. And the memo, you know, the memo that was sent to the council mentions that the road width is being narrowed <laughs> it's being narrowed and the travel lanes are going to shrink from, I think it's like a, like 15 foot travel lanes or, you know, 14 foot travel lanes down to 12 foot travel lanes. But again, if you don't actually um, mark, like line the, like mark those travel lanes, it's not always clear. I think to drivers that there is like a 12 foot lane and a 12 foot lane where it's different than if you're on a road where it's marked, where I think drivers are more likely to stay on their side of the road. Um, and so you know, in some cases, particularly if there's not a lot of traffic or times a day where there isn't a lot of traffic, that some drivers may view it just as a 24 foot wide road 
um, that they can go what speed they want to. And, and you have seen that as like was mentioned earlier in the meeting by one of the public commenters about, you know, in certain subdivisions and so on when the roads are pretty wide and that's, that's people's experience, right? Um, so, I mean, those are just our kind of general comments. And there had also been some comments about lighting, you know, just the light is important. If you have the mini roundabout, I believe one of those intersections proposed for the mini roundabout currently doesn't have a light. I think it might have fallen down or something. Um, we we also mentioned the idea of exploring 17C, I mean, chapter 90, 17C. And um, I mean, those are our kind of main points. And also just the idea too, that this is like having a sidewalk along the section of Heatherstone really needs to be viewed as like part of like growing the whole network because the current proposal would just end the sidewalk in the middle of Echo Hill, right? It wouldn't actually be, wouldn't let many people to get from there to here or anything so that you really do need to, the town does need to be committed to extending that as like, you know, budget allow and time allow to like make it a full connection out to, um, out to the Southern half of Heatherstone Road and then hopefully also out Stony Hill Road and Gatehouse Road, like out to Route 9. Um, and in the Amherst Pedestrian and Bicycle Plan, it was that Southern piece of Heatherstone Road and Gatehouse Road and so on that were the priority, um, just because there is like such a busy bus line along Belchertown Road and there is so much more traffic out there and so on. So that plan had focused on that section and not the section that we're talking about in this current proposal. So thank you. George? That's right. You're muted. I'm sorry, I keep turning my sound off so you don't get to hear all the noise where I'm, I'm at. I apologize. I'm prepared to make a motion. Okay, well, you, go ahead. I move that uh, the town that the town that we recommend that the town council approve permanent changes to the public way on Heatherstone Road as shown on the conceptual plan titled Heatherstone Road Sidewalk Concept, dated February 29, 2024. I'll second. His motion has been made and seconded. I guess that I have one question that's still. Uh, bothering me, and that's the mini roundabouts. And uh, I think I'm, my concern is that I don't really know that we have a clear conception of what is what will now be constructed in the way of roundabouts and the effect on um, specialized transportation that runs through there and is it uh, you know will uh, will it inhibit uh, fire equipment and uh, BBTA buses or uh, is the will it just slow those traffic uh, Jason um, the so the roundabouts we're considering for these little mini roundabouts they're really small they're like a five foot diameter think of it like a really big trash can lid in the road um, and they're very shallow so they'd only be about three inches high with like a two inch reveal on the outside edges maybe four inches at the most so if you drive straight over it you're going to feel a bump so you're going to have to veer out you know and this is more for passenger cars because that's more of the speeding problem within the neighborhood so the passenger cars are going to want to veer around them so they don't hit the large bump um, but the emergency vehicles uh, moving vehicles ups that sort of stuff they'll if they're you know they'll mount over it if they have to make a turning movement but if they're just use doing a straight maneuver they can they'll veer around it so they're the, the entire center island is completely mountable by large vehicles and if it turns out to not be a popular or useful thing, uh, they aren't difficult to remove either. 
we've talked about a couple different options of maybe doing a temporary, you know, an initial temporary removable one to see as sort of like a, a practice or a study. Um, and then we could replace them with something more permanent in the future if they we find they're they're working and they're doing the job and they're helping calm traffic. That's right. Yeah, I think that also what we've learned, at least I've learned over the last uh, many weeks of discussing and, and reading is that um, any kind of change we can make to the, the layout of the road, um, the traffic calming measures is, is helpful. So this is a pilot. If it doesn't work out, it's easily removed. And it's an effort to try and, and, and reduce speed by making a, a physical change, which seems to be often more impactful than, than just changing a speed limit. So I think it's worth a try. And my understanding is that um, they're small enough that we don't have any land taking issues. Is that your understanding, Jason? Um, we have we don't have a full survey in the neighborhood yet, so I'm a little cons. So the the only thing the only thing that the mini roundabouts change as far as the sidewalk plan goes is that the sidewalk actually has to veer out a little further at the intersections. So to go around the circle. So my only quandary is if there are property pins out there that we just kind of need to locate them and maneuver the roundabout around certain things. So I don't think we need takings, but I don't know for sure. There was one lot we come really close to and we might take a little corner like a two foot square or two, two foot triangle is what we looked at first. You talk to the property owner about that. That might be the one we don't do. We said two to three. And what? Which of the intersections that they would be at? You know? Uh, I don't rem we we I don't remember which ones we actually said we put them at. We we still have some more laying out to do on that. Jennifer, me. Yeah, no, I was um, found the listening session very helpful because it did seem like the vast majority of residents in the area do support these traffic calming measures. Um, that was my take away from the listening session, which was n more so than uh, public comment at our first meeting um, about this issue. And I think that coupled with staff's recommendation and tax uh you know confirm you know recommendation and agreeing with all the recommendations that i feel that um you know i definitely i support this package of measures for heatherstone road and let's uh move to a vote we have a motion on the floor it has been seconded councillor ryan aye uh jennifer yes uh, Bob? Aye. Council Lord? Aye. And I'll vote aye, so it's unanimous. And we will uh, report that recommendation. And I'll consult with the president about when these uh, two matters can be on the agenda so that we can have a report in writing. And I will uh, try and get, get a draft written for the committee on the report to cover that. So the one additional item that we want to get back to um, is the uh, additional speed limit option of MGL chapter 90, section 18B. And I just, in, a, in one other note that I want to make is that um, we have a, you know, to really respond to some of the comments that we received at the beginning, which started with uh, students from Port River. Um, there are a lot of things that really have to do with roadway and sidewalk issues. I think that uh, that's going to be a bigger discussion that may have to take place at a separate date. But if we don't, we can't really solve the sidewalk problem. I, I 
two have uh, driven through there just to look at sidewalks. I noticed one other thing because of the date that I chose to go through, and that is um, if it's trash day or near trash day, but you also have a lot of uh, USA trucking uh, bins out on sidewalks that um, inhibit the use of the sidewalks as a bicycler route, even if you're going to otherwise solve the, the other issues. Gilbert? Um, I was just going to say for the the thick the the changing the speed limit, lowering the speed limit, the de facto speed limit down to twenty five. Um, if that's something that that you really want to take up, that's I that's only an issue. It, it, the enforcement will be the enforcement we have. It just lowers the speed limit they have to enforce. Um, but as Captain Ting or Chief Ting said, you, you really. There really isn't the staff to do that, but putting putting the signs up throughout town as you enter a town that says this is a thickly settled town and it's twenty five unless otherwise posted those, those that might not be a bad thing to do. Um, where I grew up, that was every community had the ability to do that. You uh, it was posted twenty five when you entered the town border and unless it was otherwise posted, which is what you would do if you actually enact that that measure. So I'm not really sure. Um, it might be a good thing to do and might just help a little bit, but. You spoken with your colleagues at other communities like in Northampton, where they have done it as to whether they perceive a difference? Um, other communities that do would say that it, it does make a difference. I mean, as, as we talked about earlier, people are just getting a little wild and crazy out there in the roads. And those people are going to be wild and crazy for people who follow the rules are a little more attuned to what's going on. They say, Oh yeah, I need to slow down. Um, they might speed up a little bit later on, but they do slow down. So there is a bit of an impact on it. I don't, I don't know how we, we totally slow people down unless we have some way of video enforcement that, um, the state allows us to do video enforcement, which is, uh, I don't think they'll ever do that. Bob? Yeah, I, I wanted to, uh, I grew up in New Jersey and in New Jersey, the default speed limit is 25 in a town and 50 on the highway, unless it's posted. So everybody knows that. And, you know, I don't, I don't, I have no idea whether it's enforceable or it's enforced, but that's, that's the law, uh, which is very interesting. Um, you know, the, the other thing I want to mention, just in response to Guilford's comments, is New Jersey tried video enforcement of people running traffic lights, and it they couldn't ever really uh, convict anybody or, because they can just say, hey, I wasn't driving the car. It was my car, but I wasn't driving it. And so they, the legislature finally just said, forget about it. We're, we're, they just completely uh, abolished the, the law. So it, it's a great idea, but I don't think it really works. But I, I am in favor of posting 25, um, you know, uh, thickly settled, uh, on, on, you know, as much as we can. I think it's a, a good idea. And I think uh, I, it doesn't solve the, the problems where, You've got a posted speed of 30, but at least it it alerts people that it's thickly settled and we should slow down. Uh, Tracy? Yeah, so I had a question for Captain Ting, just um, like if we did have, if Section 17C was adopted and there were these signs posted at the, you know, the town line saying that, you know, that we did have this default 25 mile per hour speed limit. Is that sufficient on local roads to actually ticket people if they are going over the speed limit on the roads that aren't otherwise posted? Or do you actually need to, I mean, what extent would you actually be able to like ticket them, for example, for going? So the, the way it works for, for us to issue citations, you know, we fall under chapter nine, chapter, um, 90 section 18 for posted 
uh, speed limits in chapter 90, section 17 for unposted. So when it's unposted, that means uh, whatever we determine is reasonable and proper. So if it's thickly settled, you know, certainly we uh, will gauge it and uh, a thickly settled area is, is about 30 miles per hour. So um, if it's not posted, then we will utilize 9017. If it is posted, it's 9018. So whatever the posting is, is <clears throat> that would be sufficient enough for us to enforce whatever limit that that is uh, displayed. Hopefully that answers that question. Yeah, thank you. Jennifer? So would this, uh, the if we were going to have the default be 25 miles an hour, is that something that would would go before the council for? And is that something we would recommend now? I'm just trying to, the process of how we get from here to there. It is, it ultimately does have to be a council action. So yeah. it would be a, uh, the motion of this committee could only be to recommend to the council, um, but the council has to act. And so is that a motion we'd want to make, or do you think we need to discuss it more at a future point? I think that's a question for the committee right now. And if somebody makes a motion, they make a motion. Uh, I don't know that we have a lot additional to learn. I mean, I, I do think right. uh, a lot of the things that I, I keep coming back to everything always comes back to budget. Uh, you see, you know, when we talk about improving our sidewalks and streets in order to make them uh, more bicycle and pedestrian friendly, improving our sidewalks, that's a budget issue. When it comes down to enforcement, I think the chief has been pretty clear to the finance committee and to us today that the uh, department does what it can do with current resources, but that um, things like uh, increased traffic enforcement really requires uh, more officers and uh, the budget issue. But if we wanted, but it's it doesn't sound like it would be <clears throat> terribly costly to have the default speed limit be 25. Well, Guilford can answer that question. Yeah. I think that the only answer, the only cost to that would be the signage question. It would range from about five to ten thousand dollars in signs right now. So do we want to move to recommend to the council? Let's see what George is going to do. George. Yeah, I'm trying. I'm trying to think what the argument would be against that, um, other than the cost. Um, if we had staff um, saying no, this is a bad idea, or you know, it's just you know, yeah, you can do it, but there's just no way we can enforce it. But we're not hearing that. We're, obviously, enforcement's a challenge, but that's a challenge always. I think what this does is send a message um, community wide that we take the issue of speeding seriously, and this is a community that is moving towards. Uh, true bike and pedestrian safety. And one key step would be to reduce the speed limit to the, to the degree that we can. Um, if we just leave things as they are, what's the argument for that um, other than I mean, cost? And, and if that is an issue, then someone needs to raise it. Um, but five or $10,000, while it's not nothing, is is seems not that great um, given the message we're trying to send. A lot of this is education as well. Um, and we can be play a role in that as counselors and also as, as the council. Um, so I guess what I'm asking my colleagues is, well, give me an, or, or the assembled experts here, give me a good reason why we shouldn't do this or more reasons. I can't think of any. What would be a good reason not to do this other than cost? Jason? Um, the only thing I see, and it's not a huge, I wouldn't say it's a cost issue. It's just, I think you're going to hear from a lot of neighborhoods that are already posted 30, that they're going to want their speed limit rescinded. And there's a there's a process through MassDOT that you have to go through to get a speed limit rescinded. Um, but it's doable. We just, it takes time. That's the, the, the thing we don't have much of. 
is uh is time to do all the paperwork to get it all officially rescinded and then removal of the signs so it's something that can be done it's i just expect sort of uh this would kind of open the floodgates to a lot of neighborhoods that already struggle with speeders they're going to want they're going to want it dropped to to the default 25 while they're currently posted at 30 or possibly 35. Mm -hmm. Merci. Um, I just have a related question to what uh, Jason just mentioned. Is Heatherstone currently posted with a speed limit? Like I'm looking at the mass road inventory, mass DOT road inventory file right now, and it's saying that it's posted for 40 miles an hour. But are there actually signs that say that, or maybe the mass DOT inventory file is not correct? I've got. I showed it posted at 30. Okay. Thank you. Jennifer. Well, it seems it would also be uh, as counselors, our responsibility to manage that demand and to let our constituents know that this is going to take some time, but that we've made a huge step in the right direction. That we would have to do, do what we can. And now we have new communications manager, looks like coming on board, that would be some community education. I think the community would appreciate that we've done this and just to manage the expectations that it's going to take some time before new signs are rolled out. Uh, it's more than time, just so we, but I'm not. Time and expense. That's <laughs> exactly because uh, there is that whole process that if you look at, um, the material that we've received over the past couple of days and what it takes to modify regulatory speed limits. Uh, you know, there's the whole speed study, there's uh, having to get permission from DLT, all sorts of pieces. Uh, do, would we have to do that if that was our default speed if limit? It's posted. I think the point was that if it's a default, no, for, for the default sections, but anything that's already posted at a higher speed limit, you'd have to go through. It's a, you would uh, still have to do the study. That my understanding is that it's if it's posted, it's posted and it's posted above 25. Oh, it's okay. Right. Speed limit, it would require that process. Gilford can answer that. I don't yeah. if, if it's already posted, you have to stay with the posted speed limit. You can't just go the default speed limit. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Uh, Bob? Yeah, I just want to, uh, my, my comment is, I don't think we should, I, I don't minimize the, the impact on uh, DPW for doing all these studies and, and, and everything, but I don't think that um, the, the, that should be the enemy of what's really in the best interest of the town, which is traffic calming. And so I think whatever we can do that moves the ball forward, we should move it forward. And we just need to budget for what it's going to take to reduce the traffic, uh, the, the speed limits where people want it reduced. Um. To the extent that it would require more staff, that becomes a larger issue financially than just it's not it's not a minor thing given as we know from the budget side. Guilford, is your hand still up? So I didn't you want to add? Yes, sorry. Um, I did want to add. In this legislation for doing thickly settled, you actually have two options. Option one is to accept this town wide. And if you do it town wide, which is basically what we've been talking about, you put signs up as you enter the town saying thickly settled mm -hmm. 25 miles per hour unless otherwise posted. The second way that you can implement this is to do it street by street. So for every street that has a de facto speed limit, not a regulatory speed limit, but has a de facto speed limit, 
you can vote that street to be thickly settled and to post the speed limit. What that does for you is, is that instead of having signs when you enter town, when you get on that street, that street will have a sign that says thickly settled 25 miles an hour. Um, it just gives the perception that the street has a posted speed limit and it tells you on that specific street, this is 25 miles an hour. So those are the two options in the in the handout we gave you from Mass DOT. It's it's in that handout. It's on page 26. If you want to read more about it, it talks a little more in detail about it. But that's that's the two options with this this accepting this section of MGL. One is town wide, and one is street by street. But it's default street by default street. Not you can't do a regulatory street in there too. It's just the default streets. And I think that we know from the um, other item that was sent to the committee, uh, it's a slightly different DOT thing that it listed all of the communities that it had accepted the statute. Most were townwide. That's what's recommended, but <clears throat> if you want to try to have a little more... <laughs> A little more visibility that this this street in particular is 25. This is the de facto speed limit is 25 here. You could change it a little bit. Makes it. I think it makes your motion and how you accept it harder. But. But couldn't you just uh, adapt it townwide and still choose to put 25 mile an hour signs in additional places? No, the regulation says that you can you're only need to use these 25 mile an hour signs on street by street. George. And in that case, you would have to street by street means every single time you do it, you'd have to go through some sort of process, debate, discussion, et cetera. Um, you couldn't just uh, Guilford sort of look around and say, okay, I think we should use it here and we should use it here and we should use it here. Um, you'd have to do it each street separately um and through a process is that correct not necessarily you could do you could go ahead and just have one process and say we were we're going to name these streets which have the de facto authority to be now thickly settled and their de facto speed will be 25 and do it once and list mm -hmm. the streets i think gabe wants to say something <laughs> No, I'm good. <laughs> George? Yeah, just the, I guess the only other question would be whether that would make it any easier or it wouldn't make any difference at all for enforcement. Mm -hmm. um, if you have the sign there, um, obviously you can point to it and say, well, you know, didn't you see the sign? Um, <clears throat> but other than that, I mean, I'm entitled, I'm feeling like making a motion here, but um, I, I it, and maybe I'll see where it goes. Um, we have a choice, Guilford's pointed out, between town-wide versus street by street. We could come back and discuss this in more detail, um, but I get a strong sense, I may be mistaken, that uh, my colleagues on the committee feel that we need to um, do something. And, and this is uh, seems like a, a positive step. It does have some challenges, but they're certainly not insurmountable. And just letting things stay the way they are doesn't seem like the kind of message you want to send. Um, especially given what we've been hearing from our constituents, what we're hearing from Guilford in terms of the behavior of people over the last few years and from uh, from Chief Ting as well. Um, it seems like this is something we should probably do. Um, so um, I'm prepared to make a motion, but I'm also prepared to wait. Anyone have any thoughts one way or the other? Jennifer? Um, I would support making a motion, you know, for a town-wide speed limit. Not not necessarily, not street by street. George, you want to make motion? Uh, I, um, uh, I would move that um, TSO recommend that the town council adopt MGL chapter 90, subsection 17C, which would establish a uh, default speed limit of 25 miles an hour on all streets that are not posted with a regulatory speed limit. 
Second. Motion been made and seconded. Any further discussion? If not, we will proceed to a vote and uh, go with the same order. Uh, Councilor Ryan? Aye. Jennifer? Yes. Bob? Aye. <clears throat> Councilor Lord? Aye. And I'll be an aye. So it's unanimous. So I uh, consulted the president about when she had to have it on the agenda and proceed from there. So we've actually completed, I think, the uh, entire agenda, and it is uh, 12 o'clock, just about, so just a couple minutes after. So uh, we've met our two-hour time limit. Anything else that people have uh, our next meeting, I think it's on the 13th, and we are going to be focusing on the trash hauling issues. Um, Tracy? Um, so, you know, if I may, I when the Fort River students came and spoke, you know, they were talking about the issues related to school zones and speed limits and school zones and so on. And I know also that the JCPC, when they reviewed Jeremy Anderson's request about having um, the radar speed signs that they had recommended one, they had recommended money for them, but then they had also recommended that, you know, the the council work with uh, the DPW, the police, and so on to uh, decide on like where they would be placed and what the rules would be and so on. So, I was just wondering if that's been something on the NTSO's radar, if you will, about when that might come back. Um, it does seem that there have been a number of issues concerns raised specifically about the speed around school zones and um and in school zones it is 20 miles per hour you know it's not the de facto 30 or 25 so it would be great it would be great to see tso take that up again okay Thanks. um actually it raises an interesting question chief well you're now uh, since you're still here um uh, what is your thought about uh, extending the time for the lower speed limit in school zones and those requested by the students. I think that, uh, I think it's a great idea, you know, to be honest with you. Um, I think it, you know, part of it is if it makes it, if, if it makes everybody <laughs> feel safer, that feeling of security in it of itself is, is important. You know, and to be honest with you, I know there have been some studies that show that that's not necessarily uh, helpful because a lot of times people realize that when schooled, they're, they're going to question. They're going to say, well, you know, I don't understand why these lights are flashing right now. The kids are in school. It's not drop off time. It's not pickup time where it, that's traditional in a lot of communities. But I do think that you know, when you're driving through there and all of a sudden you see that flashing 20 mile per hour and you realize you're in a school zone. For me, at least that's automatic for me to slow down. And again, if that provides mm -hmm. a sense of security for for the children, especially if you look at Fort River, um, they are crossing the street a lot. There's a lot of activity that goes on around there. And yeah, that's definitely a good spot. Um, so I am in agreement with that. Is there any regulatory reason that we can't do it? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Yeah. No. So it really could be a, even an administrative decision. As well as because that the, the council would need to direct it. Mm -hmm. to, to answer your question, I'm in support of it. Would it be helpful for the council to make a statement on it? And if so, then we should consider that. George? I wonder if this also could be linked to the whole Safe Routes to School uh, program, which I believe Tracy's actually sent us something on, but I wasn't able to find it, but I'm, I'm sure I've got it somewhere and also our bike and pedestrian plan um, as part of a larger discussion of, of the issue of, of safety, pedestrian, bike safety, and speed 
particularly related to kids and schools? Is that something we could put on our agenda? Um, yes. Why don't we take that as a future discussion? I'd like to see that as possible, a future agenda item, um, certainly focused on speed around schools and um, what we could do, recommend to the council about that, and also maybe a presentation on safe routes to schools and bike and pedestrian plan, which I know I have the bike and pedestrian plan. I haven't looked at it in a while, but I could use something with safe routes to schools. Maybe we could invite the fifth grade back. They they seem to be pretty they seem to be they seem to be pretty up to date on this stuff. <laughs> we could use their help. <laughs> and I also want to make a quick request, not necessarily for the next meeting, but at some point as soon, I'd like us to look at the TSO review process, which is currently on our website. I'd like that to be an agenda item. Yes. One meeting when we have time. It shouldn't take that long. It should only take a few minutes, really. Mostly, I'd like my colleagues to read it, um, and then I'd like us to decide what we want to do with it. That's the TSO review process, which is adopted 8-8-2020, which is currently on our TSO website. Uh, just a quick note. I did take a look at that after you brought it up last time, George, and removed the word draft because it had been adopted, and there was some weird highlighting that I removed. So it looks Thank more you. like a final document. That would, that's that's good. But if you could put that on the agenda, I'd appreciate it. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to add that, you know, uh, the elected official, as as an elected official, and I'll, I'll speak for other elected officials, that they, they tend to want to decide things. But if there's an administrative solution to any of these problems, we should take it and we should encourage the town manager to to make to move on it um i i, I don't want to wait for you know the the counselors you know all 13 of them to make up their minds um I, you know i think it's time we we act uh and we act as fast as possible jennifer i was really going to say the same thing and certainly with the uh flashing lights uh, for extended period around the schools i mean we should aim to have that in place by the start of the next school year. You know, whether that's done administratively or by council vote. Yeah, well, why don't we uh, consult with the town, let him decide whether he wants us to uh, have council vote or whether he feels comfortable just saying, yeah, let's make the change. Anything else? Otherwise, I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Okay, motion to made second. And, uh, going through the same order, uh, Councilor Ryan? Aye. Jennifer? Yes. Uh, yeah, yes. Councilor York, Lord? Aye. And I'm an aye, so we are adjourned. Thank you very much. And it's been a great meeting, uh, Chief Ting. Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you, everyone. And Gilford and Jason, thank you. Gilford, Tracy, thank you. Thanks.